I'm Doug Hamilton. I'm waste management specialist for the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. And you, you may wonder why a guy from Oklahoma is talking about alligators. I, I'll assure you, we do have alligators in the wild in the southeast corner of the state, in the marshes along the Red River. But we have no alligator production in Oklahoma. Uh, oops. Um, but the, an interesting thing is a lot of the the cultures that developed in uh, alligator country, the Seminole, the Muskoki, the Choctaw, the Caddo, now are residents of the state of Oklahoma. So if uh, Osceola, the Seminole national hero, would to see an alligator, he would have called it Hulpata. That's how you pronounce that. Uh, but why I am, why you're listening to me today is we have a, uh, a waste management channel on YouTube where we were looking at, we are looking at uh, different types of waste systems so that farmers can see virtually before they get into a, a particular practice. And back in 2010, we went down uh, to Louisiana. Dr. Uh, Ron Sheffield uh, was doing some treatment for alligator wastewater. And with his passing, I guess I've become the de facto national uh, expert on alligator waste. Uh, why do we have uh, farms with alligators? There's a number of products that come from alligators. The number one money maker for them is leather. Um, they grow the alligators up to about four feet in length uh, for for leather. The um, the growth of an alligator is really regulated by temperature. So if you have a 90, 92 degree uh, temperature, they'll get to four foot in about a year, 12 months. They like to raise them slower, so they'll drop the temperature down to 80, 82 degrees, and they end up with a much more beautiful uh, leather, and that takes about 16 to 18 months to get up to, to four feet. The second big product or the, of alligators is the meat, and when you look at an alligator, it's almost all tail. So the tail meat is used uh, Restaurants, uh, county fairs, you can get fried alligator tail. Um, I haven't seen it in the store. Probably if I'm in Florida or Louisiana, they have it in the store. Their number three item is novelty items. You can get keychains with an alligator foot. They sell the teeth. Uh, here we have a head. I can imagine back when I was in college, I could see this in someone's dorm room with an ashtray in the middle of it. Um, and then the fourth thing is tourism. <laughs> There's farms that uh, let you come watch them feed the alligators. Instigator Ranch, the, the place we were filming, uh, you, they have a little kiddie pool and you can play with the alligators. They have their, their mouths are taped shut. Uh, also, they let you hold an alligator egg in your hands while it's hatching. Uh, the, the alligators themselves are kind of an interesting beast. I don't think we have any other confined animals uh, feeding operations that are actually reptiles. There may be some snake farms, I don't know. Um, but the alligator is, is interesting. Their anatomy is more, or their digestive anatomy is more in line with uh, birds than anything else. Um, they have two parts of their stomach. They have a gizzard somewhat like a chicken. Um, they also, like chickens and birds, they, only, they, they do not have a urethra, so all of their urine mixes with feces and exits through what they call the cloak wall, which would be the anus in a, uh, in a, in a mammal. And like birds, about 70% of all the nitrogen excreted by an alligator is in the form of uric acid. Uh, the other thing that's kind of different about alligators than most of our domestic species is they're an apex predator. Um, so they, they are fed a very high protein diet. In the wild, they eat, eat their food whole, but that we generally have some kind of a manufactured feed, and that feed is going to be about 50% protein. Uh, comparatively, cat food, which is also fairly high protein, is about 20%. So if you want to look to an analogous animal to an alligator, uh, you'd have to look to your apex, uh, aqueous apex uh, predators in the bird kingdom, uh, bald eagles, osprey, that sort of thing. Now there's two basic ways that uh, alligators are raised on farm. The first one is the alligator farm, and that's predominant in uh, Florida, some in Georgia, southern Alabama. 
what makes an alligator farm an alligator farm is all the breeding stock are raised on that farm. They have the mother alligators, and I'm assuming the father alligators, and they lay the eggs, and they harvest all of the four-foot marketable gators. So you could call that a closed system. In the state of Louisiana, uh, it's kind of unique. The Louisiana Department of, of Wildlife and Fisheries issues licenses to alligator ranchers, and they go out and collect eggs from the wild. Um, and then they release 10 to 15% of the four foot alligators out in the wild. Uh, the, the 10 to 15% comes from the fact that in nature, only about 15% at most of the, the hatchlings are gonna live up to, to be four foot about one year. And so you could call that an open system and that, that the animals are taken from the wild and are returned to the wild. Most almost, this is the slides you're gonna see now are from the instigator ranch. Almost all of the alligators raised in the United States are raised under roof. There st still may be a few open systems in Florida, but none of them in Louisiana. This particular farm, uh, they have three barns and then the, they have one long pit in each, in each barn which are separated up into pins. Very similar to a, a, a slatted floor, floor hog barn, for instance. Uh, the, the alligators spend most of the time in the water. You see there's a little ledge here in the corner where they can crawl up on, and they also feed them on that ledge. Uh, just like a hog barn, that pit is filled through the pit recharge system. They have a well that fills the, the pit, and then they can pull that the pull plug in the middle and it's going to let all the water out the entire length of the barn. They get in there with a pressure washer and wash out all the solids. The alligators love that. In fact, they are, are constantly spraying the alligators, at least in the summertime, for, for heat control. Um, you might ask what an alligator is fed. All of the alligator ranches in Louisiana have some form of prepared feed. Uh, this guy was actually buying his food from Land of Lakes Purina, they, they actually sold a, a gator chow to him. Uh, one of the things that the uh, people, at least in Louisiana, are very sensitive to, you may have heard of people that uh, started raising alligators for a mortality method for poultry farms. Um, those type of people are fairly ostracized by the alligator ranching community. They like to, they, they take pride in their product and, um, and the raising them, them for them is a fairly serious business, although they do the tourism. This is what the uh, influent coming out of those barns looks like. The uh, pipe on the left is a pit that's had the, the, the plugs pulled. So that's gonna be the, the, the manure and fro, from the pit. And the one on the right, that's just the overflow from all those sprinklers in, in a particular barn. This farm used a holding pond to uh, hold waste, and then they irrigated it onto about a 20 or 25 or 30 acre field. And they were using the K-line pods. They would pull them out with a, a four-wheeler, move them around. Uh, the, the one thing you might ask, uh, particularly, one, how did they size that field? Well, it just happened they had that much land. Um, and if you went and tried to do a nutrient management plan on an alligator farm, you'd quickly find that there is no book data on alligator manure and characteristics. NRCS, ASABE is not going to have that data anywhere. And it's pretty hard to find even on um, online or, uh, excuse me, um, in referee journal articles. Uh, we, I am working on a fact sheet that's a, com uh, that's a companion to this talk. We, uh, so... What I'm saying is the, the best way to size a facility is to take samples of the, the influent or the effluent and then uh, get good volume estimates and, and try to base it. It's probably going to fall on phosphorus lines. Um, but we will have uh, some information out fairly soon giving you NPK uh, concentrations for that came out of a thesis that Ron Sheffield was working on. Uh, uh, Sheffield was there mostly because the guy was interested in treating, further treating that holding pond waste, and his number one concern was odor control. He was in Covington, Louisiana, which is a suburb of New Orleans right across Lake Pontchartrain, 
and he had some pretty high priced houses in his neighborhood. So he's interested in controlling odor. Uh, that's basically reducing your organic matter and also transferring solid uh, nutrients to the solid phase. So if he wanted to uh, transport it further, he could do that. Some uh, treatment system with potential for alligator waste with the first comes to mind would be lagoon. Uh, one of the drawbacks of lagoon is that with that high a protein feed, it may not help you much with the odor control. Now you can see on the one of his barns, he's got a, a windsock. That's not for a helicopter landing. Uh, he actually monitored the wind direction so that he knew when was a good day to, to uh, spread and when was not a good day to spread. What Dr. Sheffield was working on was a calcium phosphate precipitation system where they would uh, precipitate the phosphates out and take most of the organics with them. Uh, you can see here the, the liquid on the right is after it's gone through the process. Had very little loader. Uh, it looked clear, but it probably had a fairly high ammonia concentration also. Uh, I'd be amiss since we work with anaerobic digestion here in, in Oklahoma, and we also work with a liquid digestion system. So anaerobic digestion to knock down the organics, uh, followed by struvite precipitation would achieve pretty much the same goals. Uh, that's my last slide. I want to thank John Price, who is the owner, manager of the Instigator Ranch, for allowing us to go down there. And, of course, Ronald Sheffield, the, the late, great Ronald Sheffield, was uh, the inspiration behind everything. And Craig Woods was our videographer, and most of the, the slides you see here were uh, uh, screen saved from, from our video. Um, I will be coming out with that fact sheet shortly. You can contact me there or... That's my personal website, at least for the next couple of months until um, extension changes things.